The countdown is on to one of the most awe-inspiring celestial events, the total solar eclipse happening on April 8th. It's a phenomenon you definitely do not want to miss, and I'm here to guide you through it, making sure you catch every spectacular moment. First off, let's map out where the totality hits. If you're in the path, you probably know, but visionary entrepreneur Elon Musk has shed light on how the rest of the country will experience the eclipse too. It's a nationwide affair, so no one is left out. Now, beyond the main spectacle, there are some incredible things that happen during a total solar eclipse that you might not know about. Ever heard of the diamond ring effect or got a glimpse of the sun's corona? Well, stick around because you'll want to keep an eye out for these too. And for those right in the heart of totality, get ready for a treat. I've got a 3D path perspective coming up, showing you the exact time the eclipse will grace your location. Whether you're staying put or traveling to catch this rare event, you'll know exactly when to look up. But here's the thing, as always, safety first, folks. If you're struggling to find those approved solar eclipse glasses, don't even think about watching the eclipse without proper eye protection. It's too risky for your eyesight. But if you don't have any, don't fret, we've got a cool DIY viewer tutorial coming up to save the day. And here's a twist, while everyone's eyes are glued to the skies, Musk gives us a reason to glance down. There's a fascinating phenomenon that occurs on the ground during the eclipse, adding another layer of cool to this cosmic event. So, whether you're crafting your viewer or finding the perfect spot to experience the eclipse, remember, this is a moment of unity and wonder. Stay tuned as we explore more of what Elon Musk has shared about this astronomical spectacle and get ready for an unforgettable experience. All right, let's unravel the mysteries of the upcoming solar eclipse. There's a lot to uncover, from the science behind it to the best viewing spots. The path of totality stretches from Montreal through key points like northern Vermont, Erie, Pennsylvania, and skirts major cities down into the heart of Texas, then sweeps through Mexico. If you're along this path, you're in for a treat. The diamond ring effect, the mesmerizing corona, and a momentary dusk in the middle of the day. For those in Florida, expect about 60% coverage. The rest of us, we'll see what I like to call the Pac-Man effect, where it looks like the moon is taking a chunk out of the sun. Remember those eclipse glasses or the DIY viewers I'll show you how to make. Those are crucial for your viewing safety, except during the totality's peak if you're right in its path. Even if you're not directly under the shadow of totality, there's still plenty to get excited about, from Oregon to southeast Colorado, through Kansas and into parts of Minnesota and northern Iowa. There'll be varying degrees of that partial eclipse magic to witness, so stick around as we explore more on what to expect, how to watch safely, and some of the cool phenomena that come with the solar eclipse. Let's make this celestial event one to remember. Alright folks, get ready for the main attraction for the total solar eclipse because there are some mind-blowing sights you won't want to miss. Besides the awe-inspiring corona and the jaw-dropping diamond ring effect, there's something extra special to look out for when daylight turns to dusk. Imagine right in the middle of your afternoon spotting the brightest planets and stars in the sky. How cool is that? So, where should you be gazing when the sky darkens? Let me break it down for you. As the moon slides over the sun, casting us into totality, you're in for an astronomical treat. You'll be able to spot Jupiter, shining brightly to the northwest of where the moon obscures the sun. Venus will be making a brilliant appearance in the southeast, adding to the celestial spectacle. Saturn, a bit dimmer and further towards the south and east, might require a bit more effort to spot. And let's not forget Mars, that distinct red dot positioned just to the south and east of Saturn, which might only be visible when we're fully enveloped in totality. But the crescendo of this cosmic performance? As the totality comes to a close, a single beam of sunlight will pierce through, creating the stunning illusion of a diamond ring in the sky. It's these moments from the ghostly glow of the corona to the planets taking a daytime appearance that truly make this event unforgettable. Remember, this celestial dance will be happening across the southern sky, not to scale of course, but it'll be a spectacle spread wide for us to enjoy. So if we gear up for this extraordinary event, keep your eyes peeled for these heavenly bodies joining the show, adding their own sparkle to the eclipse's magic. As the skies darken almost to night in the middle of the day, you won't just witness the sun being obscured by the moon, 
but also some of the brightest stars making a rare daytime appearance. It's as if the universe is putting on a show just for us. So here's the scoop on what's actually happening. The moon slides right between the Earth and the Sun. And though the moon is nowhere near the size of the Sun, it positions itself perfectly to block it out from our view here on Earth. This alignment casts the moon's shadow directly onto our planet, creating that narrow strip of totality, the main event we've all been waiting for. We kick off this celestial journey across the United States at 1.27 in the afternoon on April 8th, tracing the 3D path of totality. For those lucky enough to be in its path, get ready for an unforgettable sight and make sure to get your spot early. Places like San Antonio and Austin, heads up. As we roll forward, this shadow travels across the country and even into parts of Canada, giving a wide swath of viewers a front row seat to this cosmic spectacle. But hang tight, because there's more. While everyone's eyes are fixed upwards, I've got a reason for you to glance down for a bit during the eclipse. Stick around as we explore this unique perspective and make sure everyone gets a piece of the action. Trust me, it's going to be a wild ride through the stars. So, here's the lowdown on the eclipse's journey across the US and trust me, you'll want to jot this down. At precisely 1.33 PM San Antonio folks, especially on the north side, you're in for a celestial treat. If you're a bit south, a quick trip north could give you a front row seat to totality. Austin, you're totally in the shadow by 1.36 p.m. Waco, Fort Worth, you guys are all part of this astronomical party too, hitting totality around 1.41 p.m. Texarkana, you're up at 1.45 p.m. And though Fort Smith, Arkansas might just miss out, a hop south puts you right in the path. Little Rock, Hot Springs, and hey, Memphis, even if totality's what you're after, a short drive could make all the difference. By 1.53 p.m., parts of Arkansas are basking in the eclipse's full glory. Indiana's big cities, Bloomington to Indianapolis, you're in the list too, with totality arriving around 3.07 p.m. Ohioans from Columbus to Cleveland, you've got a shot at this too, though some might need to scoot around a bit for the best view, with the eclipse peaking around 3.15 p.m. The show doesn't stop there. It sweeps through Erie, Pennsylvania, Buffalo, New York, right into Rochester and Syracuse, hitting each spot with its shadowy magic well into the afternoon. And for those in Vermont, from Middlebury to Burlington, and over to Plattsburgh and North Elba, New York, you're all in this together, with totality reaching you by 3.27 p.m. Even Maine isn't left out. Lincoln, Pine Knoll, and Presque Isle your turn comes just after 3.32 p.m. And let's not forget our friends in New Brunswick, wrapping up this epic event around 4.35 p.m. local time. I've laid it all out city by city, so no matter where you are, you can catch a piece of this incredible event. Whether you need to scooch a little north or south, it's worth it to witness the eclipse in its full awe-inspiring totality. So mark your calendars and maybe even plan a little road trip. It's an astronomical spectacle you definitely don't want to miss. All right, so I've got a little twist for you. While everyone's eyes are glued to the skies, I've got a cool reason for you to glance down. And yes, this goes for both the folks in the path of totality and those catching a partial eclipse. As the moon does its thing blocking out the sun, we're plunged into an eerie midday twilight. But there's more happening than just the sky show. With the sun's rays dimmed, you'll notice the temperature dip a few degrees. A chill in the air right in the middle of the afternoon. If you've got a thermometer handy, it's fascinating to watch this drop in real time. But here comes the coolest part. If you're hanging around trees, take a moment to look at the shadows cast on the ground. Those leaves overhead, they turn into a bunch of tiny pinhole cameras, projecting mini eclipses all over the pavement, the road or whatever you're standing on. It's like the ground is sprinkled with crescent-shaped shadows, mimicking the eclipse happening above. Seriously, it's one of the most magical sights, especially if you're not directly in the path of totality and miss out on the full blackout. For those in the partial eclipse zones, this little ground show is a neat bonus to keep an eye out on for while you're waiting for the main event. And remember, safety first, those eclipse glasses need to stay on, folks. Make sure they're the real deal with that all-important ISO mark, but heads up, even that's not foolproof against fakes, so stay sharp. So there you have it, a little extra something to enhance your eclipse experience. No matter where you're watching from, keep those glasses on and maybe take a moment to appreciate the cooler, smaller details of this cosmic event. 
can't get your hands on those Eclipse glasses, no worries, because I've got a super cool DIY project that's not just fun for you, but a great activity to do with the kids too. Before we dive into this, remember, looking directly at the sun without proper protection is a big no-no. So let me walk you through making your own solar eclipse viewer with stuff you'll probably got lying around the house. You're going to need a few simple items, scissors, tape, a glue stick works too, aluminum foil, a piece of white computer paper, and the star of the show, a box. This could be any box, I'm using a big one to start, but I'll show you a more handheld version later on, so stick around. All right, step one. On the long side of your box, cut two holes, one's for peeping through and the others for the sun to shine through. Next, grab your aluminum foil and cover one of those holes. That's your sunlight entry point. Tape it down tight so that no wind's going to rip it off. Then take a nail or pencil and poke a tiny hole in the foil. This little dot is where the magic happens, allowing sunlight to pass through. Now, let's work on the inside of the box. Open it up and tape your white computer paper to the opposite side of the foil. This acts as your screen where the eclipse will be projected. Make sure it's secure. No one wants their screen to fall mid-eclipse. Here's how to use it. You're not going to look up at the sun. Instead, keep the sun at your back and let the light beam through the pinhole onto your screen inside the box. Peek through the other hole and voila, you'll see the eclipse safely. Fancy something smaller? A cereal box works great for a more portable version. Just cut two openings at the top, cover one with foil, and poke that all-important hole. Tape white paper inside as your screen. Same as before, with the sun behind you. Let its light filter through the pinhole to project the eclipse onto the paper inside. Peek through the viewing hole and enjoy the sun. Biden's war on American energy has sent prices soaring and his latest actions will make it catastrophically worse. It's going to be bad at a level that we've never seen. This will be so bad. If we don't have anything that ties us together, when that day comes, and you know what I mean, when the economic crisis comes, because it's coming, like what's that gonna look like? It's gonna be very scary. Trump issues a chilling proclamation, vowing to thwart any attempts to rig the upcoming presidential election in 2024, echoing fears of electoral manipulation. Our public obsessions are getting increasingly irrelevant, actually. Mm -hmm. Increasingly, it's like crazy. A ton more than that statement of financial condition, and she doesn't know how to get out of it because her politics won't allow her. She calls him a bully. She says he's going to bring out racial slurs. He's going to say things today and taunt her. Well, Miss James, you taunted him. Before you came into office, before you saw one record, one statement of financial condition. Elon delivers a sobering message, emphasizing the imperative of nurturing the next generation by encouraging childbirth and fostering a new era of human evolution. And I, I think that perhaps my biggest advice to leaders, to government leaders and to, to the people in general would be to make sure to have children to create the new generation. And I think any incentives that can be done to incent the new generation, to make it easier for women to have children and to support the children, I think would be very wise. Revelations of corruption within the Biden family emerge, with Hunter Biden allegedly leveraging his father's influence to extract cash, exposing a web of deceit and exploitation. Bobolensky met with Joe Biden twice, confirmed he was the big guy who called the shots. Joe Biden was for sale. The family desperately needed cash. Hunter shook them down with his dad in the room, got the cash, and then cut Tony out. Shocking allegations surface implicating the Biden family in dubious Russian energy deals, raising concerns about clandestine dealings and potential national security implications. It wasn't just China. The Biden family was tangled up with the Russians. We know about the Russian billionaire who had dinner with Joe and Hunter, wired him millions, and then left Biden off the sanctions list. But it was much bigger than that. The Biden family was brokering Russia-Chinese energy deals right under the FBI's noses. Trump advocates for energy affordability and independence, stressing the importance of securing America's energy future amidst global uncertainties. If America is going to dominate the world in manufacturing once again as it did when I was running things, you remember when they used to say you can't have manufacturing jobs in our country anymore? I said, really, why? And we created hundreds of thousands of them. But we must be the most affordable energy and 
electricity place anywhere on the planet. We have to have affordable energy. Right now, we have energy that's weak, substandard, and unaffordable. It's made by the wind. The windmills rust, they rot, they kill the birds. It's the most expensive energy there is. And we have other things that are also no good. It's called the Green New Deal. I call it the Green New Hoax. One of the reasons manufacturing jobs were flooding back into the United States when I was president was that we dramatically reduced energy costs. Sadly, crooked Joe Biden sacrificed this tremendous economic advantage on the altar of the Green New Deal, perhaps because he was bribed by Communist China or because Communist China knows all of the money that they've paid him. We have a Manchurian candidate. That's what he is. He's a Manchurian candidate. They know everything about him. And he's scared stiff. He won't do a thing. I took in hundreds of billions of dollars from China, and Joe Biden's afraid to even talk to him. Under Biden's newly proposed power plant regulations, most natural gas and coal plants will be forced to shut down. By the way, they tried that in Germany, and now they're going back and building coal plants all over the place because they've destroyed Germany. They have no energy. So Germany now is building a coal plant every two weeks. And China is building a coal plant every week, every single week. They're putting up a new coal plant. Biden's identity politics come under scrutiny, with Trump mocking his purported ethnic and religious affiliations, questioning the authenticity of his public persona. For 364 days of the year, Joe Biden goes around Washington telling everybody he's a Puerto Rican truck driving Jewish professor who was raised in a black church. But once a year, every year, Biden taps into his roots He's an Irishman. There's no holiday the president loves more than St. Patrick's Day. It's the one day of the year he doesn't have to pretend. He just tells folk tales from the old country. Biden's nepotism scandal deepens as allegations surface of using burner phones and aliases to conceal illicit dealings, casting a shadow over the integrity of the presidency. Fannie charged Trump with Rico in Georgia AOC. So if Rico's not a I guess Trump's fine. But honestly, Biden flies his son around the world to cut deals, invites his son's partners to the White House, has phone calls and meetings with them, drops sanctions on them, greases regs for them, gets their kids into colleges, and he gets his entire extended family from sons, brothers to grandkids paid millions? Cars, cash, diamonds, expensive scotch? And he uses an alias? Joe Biden uses an alias. They use burner phones to talk. Biden's donors paid his family's back taxes. Could Don Jr. stiff the IRS and his dad's donors square it up before an election? Come on. Investigators have delivered eyewitness testimony, bank records, mountains of circumstantial evidence, plus motive, physical evidence, digital communications, photographs, voicemails. The looming energy crisis intensifies as Biden's policies shutter power plants, leaving America vulnerable and dependent on foreign sources for its energy needs. And we're playing games with the wind. This is terrible what's happening to our country. There is nothing to replace our energy at this time, not even close. It's very expensive and it's very weak. It doesn't have the power to power up those big plants that you see. At the same time as Biden is shutting down existing power plants. He also wants to force hundreds of millions of Americans into ultra expensive electric vehicles. It costs twice as much as what you have and what you have is better and it goes a lot longer and it's a lot easier to fill up and we have liquid gold under our feet at a level that no other country has. But they'll strain the grid to the breaking point. It already is at a breaking point. If you look at California, it's got brownouts and blackouts every single day. People can't turn on their air conditioners, and it'll drive electricity prices into the stratosphere. If Biden's policies go forward, our electricity costs will be the highest on Earth. They're already very close with shortages, blackouts, and crippling inflation. Legal turmoil ensues in the wake of the Fonnie Willis scandal, with Democrats facing an ultimatum from the judiciary amidst mounting evidence of malfeasance. The president's always felt the luck of the Irish. His whole career, he's failed up. But today wasn't his lucky day. A judge gave Democrats the sweetest ultimatum after a scandal rocked one of their biggest cases. Either DA Fannie Willis steps down, jeopardizing the whole Trump case in Georgia, or lover boy Nathan Wade steps down and the case goes on. What do you think happened? Lover boy packed his bags. 
The Biden campaign may think this is a victory, but it's not. Tucker Carlson sheds light on the plight of illegal immigrants, painting a grim picture of uncertainty and apprehension as they navigate the complexities of migration. What does the majority of the country have in common with one another? Because look, if it, 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 the arc of the last century's his, it, American history is super, super interesting. So you have this massive influx of immigration, you know, the Ellis Island generation, late uh, 18th, or, 19th, early 20th century. And it's both good and bad. We only remember the good, but there was a lot of social volatility, like a lot. Like the mayor of Chicago got in his house it was on Wall Street. Like the whole, the Wobblies, the anarchists, like the foot soldiers that were, were immigrants, working class European immigrants. And part of the problem was there was just a lot of immigrants and I mean, Sacco and Vanzetti, you know, who the, the clerk in, uh, is it Brockton, Mass? Anyway, it was in Mass outside Boston. They had been in the country for just a few years and they immediately got sucked into radical politics. Well, why was that? Well, because they weren't kind of bought in or rooted in or hadn't been fully assimilated into American society. So then you have the first world and we basically shut down immigration and we have this period of settling. where like all Americans, let's, th let's think through our civic religion, what ties us together. And then that leads into October of 29 and you do have this national crisis last for more than a decade and we didn't, and we had a successful, you know, the CCC, we like had these big programs, which I'll say this as a conservative, kind of worked in keeping people fed and focused, it gave them purpose, kept the country from, from collapsing during the Great Depression. So, said for me, I think I am objectively one of the world's leading environmentalists in terms of doing things. I not say so. Like, I, I'm an environmentalist who does things I, of talk, of action, not talk. I act. So, so I feel I can say, as, as an environmentalist, that the environmentalist movement has gone too far. And in that, if you, in the natural extension of the environmentalist movement, if you go too far, you start to look at humanity as a bad thing. You start to look at humanity as though we are a plague on the surface of the earth, as though humanity is a bad thing. And in fact, there are some people who think and, and say explicitly that, in fact, there was on the fr front page of the New York Times, there was a guy who said, there are 8 billion people on earth. It would be better if there were none, which is crazy. What are we going to do? Number one, well, I have a lot of cash, but that doesn't mean he can take it. I mean, you know what he did? I think he looked at my cash and he said, well, we'll take all of his cash. This is all coming out of the White House. This is all everything that you see, whether it's that one or the D.A. In you Biden know, in the D.A.'s office, this? in Bragg's office, he has his top people from the DOJ working in the district attorney's office in New York. Nobody knows that. Everything is coming out. This is all election interference. They're trying to damage me so they can win another election. If I rear end your car and crease your bumper, I'm happy to jump out and say, I'm sorry, I can't believe I did that. But if I were to say invade under false pretenses and million people and spend a trillion of your dollars doing it, I wouldn't say a word. I would never admit that was a bad idea. I couldn't. It implicates me too profoundly. The same goes for if I say, locked your kids inside for a year and their brains and prevented them from getting an education. Or if I say, forced you to take a vax that didn't work that very well might have hurt you. I could never admit that I did that. I just couldn't. Because if I admitted it, I'd have to suffer the consequences. Something very much like that is happening with, which has been in progress now for almost two years. We were told at the beginning that our support would allow you to beat Russia and keep Russia from invading the rest of Europe or something. Well, almost two years in, none of that has turned out to be true. It's not going to beat Russia. The only person who's been beaten in this is the United States. The U.S. is weaker, measurably weaker, because of our support for in this. That's just true. The verdict is in. And honest, rational people admit that, no matter what their previous position. But the Biden administration cannot admit that, and neither can the U.S. Congress. And so now there is, believe it or not, an effort in progress to get the U.S. government to send another 60-odd billion dollars to the oligarchs. In so another generation of men, this one probably in their 50s, can in a pointless on the They're not going to win, but the U.S. Congress would like to keep this conflict going anyway. This is not something you should import from America. 
please don't import the work mind virus is bad. <laughs> so the, the, I mean, essentially that to summarize maybe the work mind virus, it consists of creating very divisive identity politics. So it actually amplifies work virus, mind virus in my view, amplifies racism, amplifies frankly, and all the isms. And wh while claiming to do the opposite, it, it actually divides people and makes them sort of hate each other. And it makes people hate themselves. And it's also anti-meritocratic. It's not like, it's not merit-based. So you want to have people succeed based on how hard they work and the talents, not who they are, whether they're man, woman, what race or gender, what, it, that stuff is all creating, it's an artificial mental civil that is created. And it's not, and let me say, it's no fun. Okay, it is like woke mind virus and fun are incompatible. There's no fun in that. No joy. Woke mind they, virus is all about condemning people instead of celebrating people. Like when in the woke, it just doesn't celebrate. It's all about condemning and being divisive and, and being just, I think it's just evil, frankly. So that's kind of more diabolical than what we've seen in previous generations. And it's much more effective in a committedly polite country like Canada, because you don't know that it's happening. And because a demagogue like that, or your completely bizarre cross-dressing prime minister, it's true, prime minister blackface. Um, I, didn't, I didn't wear blackface, he did. Um, he, three times, thank you, three times. And I wanna thank you for your commitment to the facts. Um, the prime minister, right, the prime minister. Um, there on your rights, which is on you and your children is cloaked in the language of therapy, self-help and compassion. You're doing this for the common good. Don't you care about the elderly? And of course, being a decent person, you care very deeply about the elderly and the weakest in your society, of course. So what you don't realize is you shuffle off to abandon another God-given right to a totalitarian government is that this is not being done on behalf of a marginalized group or the weakest among us or the elderly. They hijack the language of the gospel to crush the gospel. That's exactly what they're doing. People ask me the question, and we're going to have inexpensive energy. That's going to help us get rid of this horrible inflation. You know, he really had 38% inflation. If you look at it over his term, it's 38%. Anybody that made anything, it doesn't matter because the inflation was greater than whatever they made. We're going to get prices down. We're going to bring this country back, but we're going to make America great again, greater than ever before, and we can still do it. Musk is doing all sorts of things that appear to be useful and difficult, and it would be a catastrophe to see him derailed in his efforts. I think one of the failings Musk has is he doesn't take negative feedback uh, very well, and he doesn't uh, necessarily allow people to tell him no. Jordan Peterson reflects on Elon Musk's unparalleled achievements, hailing him as the sole architect of America's spacefaring endeavors. He said something to this friend that he never said to me, and he was saying that he was prepared to sacrifice everything his entire fortune to get a rocket into orbit. But I wanted to understand the uh, pioneering work that was being done. He's the only person who can get astronauts from the U.S. into orbit. You know, NASA can no longer do it. Boeing can't do it. So how come? H how did he make those rockets work? Amid admiration for Elon Musk's prowess, Jordan Peterson cautions against emulating his complex journey emphasizing the limitations of biographical narratives. I wouldn't say much. We, we spoke probably for 20 minutes in total, uh, not purely privately because there's other people around, but you know, I just, that just barely gets you to know the surface of someone like Musk because he's an amazing person and God only knows what's, what's up with him, all things considered. <clears throat> Well, certainly don't try this. You shouldn't try to be like Elon Musk. Biographies are not how-to books. Uh, with Steve Jobs, people would come up to me after they read the book and said, I'm just like Steve Jobs. When somebody does something bad, I tell them it sucks. I go, wait a minute, have you invented the iPhone? Have you invented the Macintosh? We don't have either the right to be that way, nor should they be that way. 
Drawing parallels between greatness and folly, Jordan Peterson contemplates Elon Musk's audacity in venturing from rocketry to Martian colonization. Th that's what did Nietzsche say? Great men are seldom credited with their stupidity. Who the hell knows what Musk is up to? I mean, obviously he's building rockets. Now he's motivated because he wants to build a, a, a platform for life on Mars. Is that a good idea? Who am I to say? He's, he's building the rockets, man, but I'd like to ask him about it. It was mainly Steve Jobs who brought us into the digital revolution with everything from friendly computers to a thousand songs in our pocket. And I spent about two years at his side doing a biography of him. And then Jennifer Doudna, who I think brought us into the life sciences revolution because she and her colleagues uh, helped invent CRISPR, this tool that can edit our own DNA, which is like, whoa, that's transformative. And so I spent a lot of time at her Berkeley lab and learning how to edit human genes. And then after that, the next logical choice seemed to be Elon Musk, bringing us into the era of space travel, electric vehicles, artificial intelligence. And surprisingly, when I talked to him, uh, he had read a couple of my books. He said, I said, I just want to do this not based on five or 10 interviews, but based on staying by your side for two years, watching you morning, noon, and night, whenever I want. He went, okay. And then I said, but by the way, I'm not going to show you the book in advance. You get no control over it. And he went, okay. And I thought, all right, this is going to be a fun ride. Were you surprised? I, I was a little bit surprised, but if you know Musk, he has sort of a little superhero complex and he thinks of himself playing big roles on the world stage, and he loves to be transparent. And I kind of suspected he would want to have this. Uh, there was a mutual friend who helped broker the deal, and the friend said, you know, he, he wants a biography. I think he sees himself in the same trajectory as a Steve Jobs or a Jennifer Doudna. Elon Musk emerges as the vanguard of technological innovation, spearheading advancements in space travel, electric mobility, and artificial intelligence, according to Jordan Peterson. Well, the first thing I would advise, and I'm going to be advising the political people I'll be talking to over the next few weeks of precisely this, and I have talked it over with Twenge and Haidt to make sure that I'm not, like I said, off on a personal tangent. I would say there's no excuse for including the anonymous posters with the real human beings. And I think that social media platforms who have a certain reach, maybe it's a million subscribers, and, and I don't really know what figure is appropriate, should be required to implement know your customer laws, and then that the people who are posting who are genuine, verified human beings, willing to abide by their words with their personal reputation, should be put in one comment section, and then the online, anonymous, cowardly, narcissistic, pathological troll demons who are polluting the public discourse should be put in a different comment section. And if you want to go to hell and visit the troll demons <laughs> and see what they have to spew, you can. But otherwise, you can be among the normal human beings engaged in normal civil human discourse. Right. And that would separate the bloody psychopaths from the, from the bulk of decent, normal people. Critiquing media scrutiny, Jordan Peterson denounces the vilification of Elon Musk, highlighting the moral imperative to separate fact from fiction. Yeah, well, it isn't obvious to me that I'm in any position to evaluate Elon Musk. Like, I would like to talk to him and find out what he's up to and why, but, I mean, he's an impossible person. What he's done is impossible. All of it. It's like, he built an electric car that works. Now, does it work completely and will it replace gas cars or should it? I don't know. But if we're going to build electric cars, he seems to be the best at that by a lot. And he more or less did that. People carp about him, but he more or less did that by himself. I know he's very good at distributing responsibility and all of that, but he's the spearhead. And then that was pretty hard. And then he built a rocket at like one tenth the price of NASA rockets. And then he shot his car out into space. That's pretty hard. And then he's building this boring company, more or less as a, what would you call it? It's sort of. It's this whimsical joke in some sense, but it's not a joke. He's amazing. Jordan Peterson marvels at Elon Musk's improbably trajectory, lauding his transformative impact across disparative fields, from aerospace to renewable energy. Well, he seems to have, although his, his, the enterprise he's put together is unbelievably 
high functioning. I mean, to produce a, an automobile sub industry that's actually competitive and to bring down the cost of space exploration by a factor of 10 and to invent reusable rockets and to have developed this boring technology. It's, it's a miraculous. He's probably an alien. He did say something, which I'll get to at the end. But he also said, you know, I don't know if they would still want that if they really knew what it's like to be me. <laughs> and it made me think that before we call these people visionaries, before they have that kind of success, we have other words for them. We call them, you know, geek or outsider, socially awkward, weird, a little different, odd one out. Unraveling the enigma of Elon Musk, Jordan Peterson unpacks the underlying rationale behind his extraordinary endeavors, attributing them to an innate drive for progress. Do, do you all believe that you were fired by Musk himself? In other words, he set it in motion. And what were some of the tweets or comments that you uh, that felt that you had to do this, that you had to undertake this, that you had to essentially uh, put out this letter? Yeah, I would say given the accelerated nature of the firings, as well as kind of more recent examples at Twitter and like other uh, Elon companies, I wouldn't be horribly surprised if he was a big driver of these firings. However, I have no direct knowledge of that. Um, Gwen Shotwell, the CEO and president, was directly um, involved in our firings. Like she was like on a call um, in the room with us for the terminations with the HR representatives. Um, but yeah, I have no direct knowledge of like Elon Musk's involvement. I just would not be surprised if, you know, he was at play here. But, but what were um, some of the, in terms of, yeah, well, I was going to yeah. say, what were some of the things that you and your colleagues felt that he had said or done or tweeted uh, that uh, made you realize that it was critical for you to put out this letter? Yeah, I would say there are many, um, you know, public statements from him on Twitter and just in general with respect to um, joking about, you know, the allegations that were made against him in a Business Insider article with respect to um, his potential harassment of the SpaceX flight attendant. Um, there were also several other kind of tweets that were collected around that time uh, where he made light of similar issues with respect to um, people's representation, with respect to pronoun usage and whatnot, um, and just like any basically several um, kind of similar issues surrounding uh, yeah, the treatment of, you know, employees in the workplace. Jordan Peterson extols the miraculous nature of Elon Musk's accomplishments, underscoring their significance in reshaping the fabric of human civilization. Oh, yeah. Well, Tabby re released some Twitter files today on, well, on, or, on Twitter, obviously, and they're going through the code. Now, I don't understand the technical details, but, you know, you don't exactly know when you see the output of a of a, of a code generated system exactly what rules it's using to sort the information i suppose that's the equivalent of shadow banning and there's all sorts of there was apparently all sorts of directives built into the code to amplify certain kinds of messages and you know de-amplify others and so apparently musk is doing what he can to to uh clean that up uh, ruben reported that the other day yeah and then tybee today he was talking more about the whole uh, Russian collusion mm. fabrication. Yeah. So that's also real fun. Delving into Elon Musk's response to public scrutiny, Jordan Peterson offers insights into the entrepreneur's resilience and humor in the face of adversity. Well, I know people who know him very well and have worked with him very closely. And these are very solid people, extremely competent and extremely creative. And they're admirers of Musk. Uh, I talk with my brother-in-law, um, Jim Keller, who's one of the world's great chip engineers, and he worked very closely with Musk for years, and he believes that in, he's in many ways exactly what you'd think he was. He's a genius, but he's also a, like a, a, a visionary genius, but he's also someone who's very, very good at implementing, very good at running companies, as you can tell, because he has a multitude of impossible su successful companies. Yes. Yes. And so he goes into a company and he cleans house and puts things in order and makes things work efficiently. And maybe he can do that with Twitter. Um, I hope he can because Musk is doing all sorts of things that appear to be useful and difficult and it would be a 
catastrophe to see him derailed in his efforts. So I'd like to wrap up by um, getting to Elon's advice, which is to always go beyond memorizing formulas, passing tests, to always go deep into the underlying principles of a subject, to track any problem down to the root cause, bury it in the dirt, in the dark. And I would add to that and say, be brave enough, be bold enough, and be insane enough to see things more completely, more vividly, more fully than everybody else around you. And refuse to look away from what you see and what you know, even if people want to burn you at the stake. Because visionaries, they take all that passion and their badass personalities and their mad skills and the mastery of their chosen subject matter, and they use it to put themselves on the line unlike anybody else you'll ever meet. And it's this that allows them to open up windows into another deeper reality in which transformation is possible and things of awe happen on a regular basis. Because in the beginning, we don't trust them because we think they're crazy, but by the end, we trust them because we know they're crazy. They're crazy enough to accomplish anything and risk it all in order to bring us something new to believe in. They might make <laughs> lousy husbands and terrible wives. They might be the friend who never sends you a birthday present and forgets to show up for coffee. But they bring light to the dark and they show us the universe. Keep the channel open. Both of them told me that that could be a failing, that that could be a weakness, which is if you try too hard to be liked, you're not going to be disruptive enough. And Musk even said empathy and collegiality can be your enemy. In a final reflection, Jordan Peterson underscores the importance of discerning truth from sensationalism in evaluating Elon Musk's legacy and contributions to society. I think he will, and apparently, he's also put the boots to the people who are tra trafficking in child exploitation already. Incredible. Two right, no kidding, no kidding. In incredible in two ways. Incredible that he did it, but even more incredible that he could do it that fast and that it hadn't been done. Right, right. So, and Musk also, it seems to me that the evidence is quite clear that he not only has a pretty good eye, but he is capable of learning. So he'll experiment and he'll learn from his experiments and we'll see if he can clean up Twitter. That's tough. I'm afraid, deeply afraid, that virtualization enables psychopathy and that that might be a fatal problem socially as we move towards a more virtualized world. It's not easy to keep the Machiavellian, psychopathic, narcissistic sadists under control. They're a small proportion of the population, but it's all about them and their short-term needs, and they'll do anything to make those paramount. It looks to me that when we virtualize the world, we take all the constraints off those people. And that's not good. So, for example, on social media, all the, hand, all the power's in the hands of the accusers. Wow, that's not good. You know, believe all women. It's like, yeah, fair enough. Except it's believe most women. As soon as it's all, it's like, yeah, well, what about the psychopaths? Well, they don't exist. It's like, oh, you wouldn't believe, you wouldn't say that if you ever met. I acquired X in order to preserve freedom of speech in America, the First Amendment. The true test for free speech is that someone says something you don't like, because otherwise it's obviously not free speech. Elon, visibly perturbed by Don Lemon's comments, emphasizes his acquisition of the X platform as a bastion of free speech preservation in America. The point is, um, I, that I, from my standpoint, uh, that is that X, FK, Twitter um, should uh, represent the sort of collective consciousness of humanity. Well, I, I think the, I see the, the X as uh, it, it's, it's already the number one 
source of news uh, in the world. So it is number one, yeah, uh, the number one way that people actually are informed about any kind of news, meaning real time events, is uh, on the X platform, formerly Twitter. Um, there's, there's nothing even close for real time news. It, it was actually amazing to me how much the legacy media uh, were, you know, walks in lockstep. You know, there's like nobody breaks ranks. Um, so, uh, and now we have X that breaks ranks and doesn't just go with the, whatever the approved narrative is. In a scathing critique of media deception, Elon denounces the selective narrative control wielded by mainstream outlets exposing their manipulation of public discourse. I think for, for many in the public, they don't quite realize just how much they, they, you know, deception is really going on with the media. The, 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 the biggest deception is the choice of narrative because they can, the media can say, they, they can write a story about this or write a story about that. And only, only a few stories can go on the front page. So you're deciding essentially what people should pay attention to. We also want to expand upon that. Um, and we've, we have done so with uh, long-form content. So instead of just doing what used to be called tweets, you can now do long-form posts. You can post an entire essay. In fact, you can now uh, put an entire book, post an entire book to the platform. Um, you can do long-form video content. Uh, so you can do uh, up to four-hour video segments. Um, we really want news in whatever form it is, or information, I should say, in whatever form it is, to be available on our platform, whether it's short, long, text, pictures, video, whatever the case may be. Elon unveils enhancements to the X platform, boasting significant algorithmic improvements and a streamlined system, resulting in a surge in user engagement. I think it's going pretty well so far. Um, we're seeing record usage. Um, we've added a tremendous amount of functionality. I mentioned the, uh, the, that you know, it used to be that you could only do short you know, text and maybe a picture or something like that, short video. Um, but now you can do long form text, long form video. Uh, we've added audio video calling. Uh, so you can not, not just do text DMs, you can do audio video calling. Um, we've improved the algorithm, I think, significantly um, and um, made the system faster and better and best reflected in the increased uh, usage. Uh, well, I mean, there are nonsense articles written all the time, and I certainly wouldn't agree with that one. I put it in the nonsense category. So uh, the the, the, the objective fact of the matter, in my opinion, was that um, that old Twitter was a, a fundamentally a, tw a tool of the, the far left. As far, and that was uh, really, I think, a lot of it was due to being located in San Francisco, Berkeley. Um, and so uh, it wanted to essentially project the SF Berkeley uh, political dogma worldwide. Well, I, I guess I do in enjoy using the platform. I mean, I do call... Um, the X platform, the, the PVP or player versus player uh, platform. Um, so in video games, there's uh, player versus like environment um, where you're not playing against other people. Um, and then there's PVP, which is like hardcore. You're actually playing against other people. And- uh, so, But that's blowing off steam for you. Yeah, yes. it, it, it is to some degree, not always. I mean, obviously I use it for uh, to post jokes, to post, uh, you know, sometimes trivia, uh, sometimes things that are of great importance. While traditional platforms bend to the will of advertisers, Elon asserts the X platform's commitment to maintaining uncensored discourse, coupled with robust ad placement controls. Whereas the other platforms will censor on behalf of, of advertisers, the X platform will not. Okay. So, but you think it's uh, you don't think it's okay for them not to advertise with or pad their content or their advertisement next to something that is anti-Semitic or that is a different or, question. Uh, you, you we, we, there's there's you can absolutely choose where next to which content do you want your advertising to appear. Absolutely, of course, mm -hmm. and we do we have I think very good ad placement controls in this regard. Don Lemon's probing question about advertiser sentiment prompts a candid response from Elon, who underscores advertisers' rights to choose where they allocate their funds. I have to say, I, I, choose your question carefully. There's five minutes left. 
Okay, but so is this the same question you want to ask? Same question is you said you said that they are in the company, but you're the head of the company. The buck doesn't stop with you. And I'm going to stick to that. And if that means making less money, so be it. If given a choice where an advertiser is saying like you have to censor all this content on the, on the platform, irrespective of where they're advertising appears. Uh, then our answer will be like, look, you, you, you can choose where you want your advertising, what you want your advertising to appear next to, but you can't insist on censorship of the entire platform. And if you insist on censorship of the entire platform, even where your advertising doesn't appear, uh, then uh, obviously we will, we will not uh, want them as an advertiser. So what, what would you say to advertisers to, who have left the platform or who are considering coming back or not coming back? What would you like to say to them? Well, first of all, uh, almost all of our advertisers are coming back to the platform. So it's a very short list of advertisers who are not coming back to the platform. Um, and uh, our advertising revenue is rising rapidly. Uh, and our subscription revenue is rising rapidly. And I feel very optimistic about the future of the X platform. I think people should be allowed to say things that are within the law. You know, that's... if. if, if um, if the, if the law isn't good enough, then great, we'll talk to your elected, re, elected representative and have them pass law to change that. But otherwise, we need to stick to, you know, uh, hold true to the Constitution and the laws and allow people to say things, even if we don't like what they say. Elon champions the expansion of the Overton window, advocating for broader discussion parameters free from the specter of social ostracization. I've generally tried to say, like, to increase what the so-called Overton window of what can be discussed, what, what you know, what, what is it okay to discuss without being ostracized. Um, certainly, attacking DEI was, you know, would have been ostracized before, not, and not anymore. Um, and um, you know, any, anything that's sort of sensitive, or, or, or that the media ignores, uh, the, the public can then, you know. Raise, the, raise it on, on the X platform and, and, and make that an actual topic of discussion. Asserting advertisers' autonomy, Elon defends their prerogative to abstain from supporting certain content or platforms, free from external coercion. We, we try to be as objective as possible. Like, is something breaking the law uh, or, likely, or, or most likely breaking the we law? We don't need a judge to say it for sure, but this, as far as being said, um, it seems to be illegal. Um, like someone saying they're going to f*** somebody, uh, I think threats of f*** are illegal, um, for sure. <laughs> um, and, uh, you know, so that would result in a suspension. Um, and, um, and, and then there's, there's a separate thing which is like, uh, you know, is, is something e either sort of potentially or, uh, not safe for advertisers, meaning it's, a, it's a, the topic is too contentious to expect that advertisers will uh, advertise, you know, with that account. Um, if you take like Dom DeLuca as an example recently, where you know he he says some pretty edgy stuff, um, and that's okay. But but just just as he has the the the, the right to say edgy stuff, some of it which, which is untrue, and he gets community known it all the time. Um, but uh, advertisers also have the right to not advertise uh, on Don DeLuca's uh, posts. You know, so it's like, you know, his freedom to, he has freedom to say what we want, but he doesn't have, he, he can't coerce advertisers to advertise. I mean, the degree, yeah, the, the degree to which, and, and by, by the way, Jack didn't really know, know this, but the degree to which Twitter was simply, um, an arm of the government was not well understood by the public, and uh, it, it was there was no it was whatever the official government. I mean, it was like Pravda, basically. Um, you know, it's a state publication is the way to think of old Twitter. It's a state publication. I mean, in fact, I was a little worried about the direction that and the, and the effect uh, of social media on the world, and especially Twitter, and. Um, I, I thought it was very important for there to be a maximally trusted sort of digital public square um, where people, you know, within countries and internationally could communicate 
Elon warns of the far-reaching consequences of a leftist ideological stranglehold, cautioning against its potential to stifle dissent and constrain freedom of expression. The technologists uh, generally are moderate, maybe moderate left, but they're, they're, not, they're, they're, they're not far left. That's why I say San Francisco, Berkeley, it's, it's, it doesn't even extend to South San Francisco or even to Palo Alto. So, so SF Berkeley is the most far left, um, perhaps, you know, in a competition with Portland, but I'd say SF Berkeley is more far left even than Portland. That like literally in America, it's, we're talking about an area that's maybe a 10 mile radius. And so the, the normally the, the effects, the negative effects of a far left ideology that is, would be geographically limited to a to 10 mile radius. That's like not, it's small, like the, so, so any, any bad effects of that ideology would be geographically constrained under normal circumstances and have been in the past. But when you have uh, basically a, techno a technological megaphone, which, which was Twitter and, and social media in general, suddenly you, the, the far left are handed a megaphone to earth. A, a, a te a, an incredibly powerful technology weapon that they themselves could not create, but they happened to be co-located with the technologists who created it by accident. Well, I think it would be, I'd like to, you know, have this sort of long-term vision of something called uh, X.com from back at, way back in the day, uh, which is kind of like a, a um, sort of like an everything app, um, where it's just maximally useful. It does, you know, payments, uh, does, um, uh, so it provides financial services, provides information flow, um, really anything digital. Highlighting systemic bias, Elon exposes the disproportionate suppression faced by conservative voices, a stark manifestation of political censorship. There was, there was uh, basically oppression of, um, any any views that would even I would say could be considered middle of the road, um, but certainly anything on the the right. I'm not talking about like like far right. I'm just talking mildly right. The people like Republicans were suppressed at ten times the rate of Democrats. Um, now that's because uh, old Twitter was fundamentally controlled by the far left. It was like completely controlled by the the, the far left, and. That's why I say, like, you know, like San Francisco Berkeley is a niche ideology. It's hard to say, like, is there a place that's more far left than San Francisco Berkeley? Maybe Portland. Maybe Portland, but it's like it's a right kind, there. It's yeah, it's like it's equivalent. those two places are the the most far left places uh, in America. Yes. Um, so f uh, from their standpoint, everything is to the right, <laughs> including moderates. Right. Right. So but now. If, 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 but if, if you internalize a far left position, uh, everything seems wrong to you that if that is not far left, right? And so they naturally oppressed any anything that didn't agree with their views. That's why I say that it was an accidental far left information weapon. So, uh, is it, 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 because it's, it's like Silicon Valley uh, attracts the smartest engineers, the smartest sort of technologists and programmers from around the world. Um, they created an information weapon that was then harnessed by the far left, who could not themselves create the weapon, but happened to be co-located where the technologists were. Elon delves into the genesis of information warfare, attributing its proliferation to a symbiotic relationship between technologists and ideologues, resulting in a weaponized media landscape. So, and I, I mean, I think this is something that is probably agreeable to um, the, uh, you know, the, le the legislators and, and the people of most countries. So, so I, th I think it's, that's a general idea, it's just um, to reflect the values of, of the people um, as opposed to imposing the values um, of essentially San Francisco and Berkeley um, which are so, somewhat of a niche ideology um, as compared to the rest of the world. And, but, but, you know, Twitter was, I think, doing a little too much to impose um, a niche, as, uh, you know, San Francisco Berkeley ideology on the world. Um, so, you know, I, I thought the, it was important kind of for the future of civilization to 
try to correct that uh, thumb on the scale, if you will, um, and and, uh, and and just more, have Twitter more accurately reflect, uh, like I said, the, the values of the, the, the people of Earth. Um, that's the that's the that's the intention, um, and uh, hopefully we succeed in, in, in doing that.